Chapter 13. When the time is right. Jim was in a fine mood at breakfast. He had made a pile of bacon, two eggs each and lots of toast. I've made an appointment, he told Aubrey. I'm going to see a special nurse, someone who I can talk to without worrying that I'm worrying her. Well done, Dad. It's about time, Jim said. You and your mum saved me, really saved me. I feel quite different this morning and hungry too. Properly hungry for the first time in months. Suzanne smiled and took both their hands. We're through the worst, she said. From now on, things are going to get better. My brave husband and my wonderful son. Better day, better every day. Right, everybody? Yes, said Aubrey. But he said it with more conviction than he felt. His father was still shaky, he could see that. Jim was putting on a great show, no doubt about it. He obviously didn't want to worry anyone, and he was definitely better than he had been. But now Aubrey's mind was racing with thoughts of the beetle ute. How to solve the mystery? And how much time did he have? How long before the beetle got fed up with rolling dung up sand dunes and came back as the terrible ute? Jim said he was going to do the housework. He was going to give the whole place a clean, do the laundry and make the house ready for Christmas. Then I'm going to plan some lessons for next term, he said. I'm going to go back to work if I feel better, which I'm sure I will. Well, said Suzanne, in that case, I'm going to take a pro proper day off for once. So I'll see you both later. Hurrah! I haven't had a day off in ages. She called her friend Caroline, made plans to go to a gallery later, packed her swimming things and away she went with a wave. Jim started tidying up, humming to himself. Aubrey put on his coat and set out for rushing wood. He walked up through the wood, noticing the holly berries and the frosty moss which looked like mint ice cream. He climbed up all the way to the moor and thought back to the desert of misfortune. In daylight, under a bright sun, the moor looked similar. Icy patches all sparkling and a cold smell of earth in the air. Good morning, said a musical voice. A hare hopped out from behind a frozen tussock. Her fur was, was a winter patchwork of whites and browns, which made her almost invisible. Her eyes were a beautiful dark gold and the tips of her ears were black. Lepus, Audrey exclaimed, you saved us. Not at all, Lepus replied, embarrassed, scratching one long ear with one long hind foot. I didn't do anything. How is Jim? He's much better, but now I've got another problem. It's the beetle ute. If we don't solve his mystery, he'll come back and Dad will be in trouble again. I need to talk to someone very wise. Could you pass a message to Athena Noctua? Lepus twitched her nose. Athena gave me a message for you. She said, when the time is right, go to High Peak. Someone will be there to meet you and take Jim. Someone who? Ah, well, someone you should meet, but someone I tend to stay well away from, Lepus said, with her, and her flanks twitched and the muscles in her long legs tensed as if she wished she was somewhere else. Someone dangerous? Who is it? Ah, well, she's very big and rather intimidating. She's visiting from the far north. How far north? From farthest north, from the enchanted mountains, said Lepus. Mr Ferriby lowered his binoculars. He'd come up to the moor because a bright winter morning was a very good time for bird watching. He sometimes saw peregrine falcons going over, looking for grouse. There were no peregrines this morning, just Aubrey talking with a hare. Extraordinary, he said, and hurried home, unable to keep a word of it to himself for a moment longer. I've got to tell you, he cried, bursting into his wife's study. He was so excited he was flushed. But you can't tell anyone else. It's just magical. What's that, Athelstan? Mrs Ferriby asked. She was working on her master's degree in psychology. She needed peace and quiet. Aubrey talks to hares and squirrels and that heron. He's best friends with that heron. I've seen an owl hanging round too. I bet Aubrey talks to him. You talk to the cat, dear. People talk to dogs, goldfish, swallows. I've heard Suzanne talking to the wood pigeons. It obviously runs in their family. But the animals and birds answer him. You should have seen him with the hare, a wild hare, and they were chatting away like old friends. Have you talked to Aubrey about this? Oh, no, 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 uh, no, I couldn't. It's his business. I don't want to embarrass him. But 
Don't you think it's absolutely amazing? What a gift! How I'd love to talk to animals. I think you'll be babbling away to the bats any minute now, Mrs Ferriby said. Mr Ferriby stared at her. They both burst into laughter. He has an incredible gift, Eunice. We are living next to the only boy in Britain who can talk to animals. I'm so relieved to have told you. I've been bottling it up. Can you imagine a hullabaloo if anyone ever found out? There would be TV people queuing here to the to the queuing from here to the village. Japanese reporters climbing over the wall, French newscasters pushing off us through the letterbox, satellites buzzing over the house like bees. It would be a perfect nightmare. You won't tell anyone, will you? Mrs. Ferriby looked at her husband right in the eye. I won't say a word to anyone about anything, Athelstan, she said. Believe me. When the time is right, Aubrey thought to himself as he made his way home. How will I know when that is? Maybe I should just ask him one question, or maybe two, Mr. Ferry thought. He doesn't have to answer, I won't pressure him. But I would just love to know something, anything, about what the animals say. There's snow on the way, Jim told Aubrey, as they ate pasta for lunch. Huge falls, they say on the radio, coming in from the far north. It's going to be a very white Christmas indeed. Coming in from the far north, Aubrey repeated. Is that what they said? Yes, it's coming tonight, apparently. I'm going to go to town and get the stores in. If it's deep, the lanes will block. We don't want to carry all the Christmas food up on our backs. Do you want to come and give me a hand? Aubrey said he would. By five o'clock, the snow was falling in thick goose feathers. By seven, the street lamp outside seemed to flicker in a whirl of flakes. By nine, there was a good inch or two on the ground and it was still falling. The family had their supper and went to bed. Aubrey woke up in bed with a start. A noise had brought him up from sleep. Was it some someone going downstairs? He looked at his clock. Midnight precisely. Zero hundred hours, said the, said the numerals. And now one of them changed. Zero o one. When the time is right, Aubrey breathed. I'll know. It's now. He got up and dressed very quickly. He went downstairs as quietly as a black cat. There was a light shining under the living room door. He opened it. There, sitting on the sofa, was his father. Jim had his head in his hands. He looked up when Aubrey opened the door. Hello, Aubrey boy, Jim said bravely. Hello, Dad, you OK? Yes, Jim said, fine. But he didn't look fine. Jim smiled. I think I must have reversed my clock. I can't sleep. Thinking about this and that. Why are you dressed? Come with me, Dad, Aubrey said. We're going for a walk. Let's leave a lo note for Mum. Are we? OK, why not? A walk in the snow might be lovely. As Jim got his boots and coat and hat, and a hat and coat for Aubrey, and gloves for both of them, Aubrey wrote Susanna a note. Dear Mum, we're going for a walk in the snow. Don't worry, we've got all our hats and coats on. We'll be back soonish. There's something I want to show Dad. Love, A.